traveled down a lonely road and no one seemed to care. The burden on my weary back had bowed me to despair. I oft complained to Jesus. A few years ago, you'll remember, there was a school shooting that took place, and I'm not real familiar, I can't remember exactly where it was, I didn't look that up. But if you remember, he was asking the students if they were a Christian. He asked the first person, are you a Christian? And he shot them. And to me, I thought about this uh, when it happened. The toughest question was the second person. Because when he asked the second young lady, are you a Christian? She knew what was going to happen with the answer. And she still said yes. And she was shot. Are you willing to die for Christ? What are you willing to do for your Savior? If you're not willing to die for Him, can I tell you this, that uh, you're not worthy of Him. You've got to be crucified. You have to die to become a child of God. And kind of like uh, some of the scenarios when people go to war, if you don't want to go into this battle knowing that you might not come back, you might want to leave now. See, when you become a child of God, you need to understand that this is going to cost you everything. You are going to lose your life. But the promise is, if you lose it, you'll gain it. When a person is crucified, it is to be final. Matter of fact, I don't know of any person except one that ever went to the cross and walked away. And it was our Savior. Crucifixion wasn't something that people looked forward to. You know, you didn't volunteer to take your friend's place. During Jesus' um, young years, while he was still growing up, outside of the city where he lived, there was a revolt that took place. And those men that were involved in that were crucified outside the city. And as Steve mentioned the other day, when Jesus looked at those nails and said, I wonder what these are going to feel like. I'm sure he looked at the, the cross with those men on there, knowing that he had a date for that cross, what must have went through his mind? See, to be crucified meant to be you were humiliated, you were tortured, you were shamed. But to become a Christian, it would mean that sometimes you are going to be humiliated, tortured, and shamed. Maybe not in the same case that the first century Christians were. But there are things that we deal with, and if you're not suffering persecution for the cause of Christ, Paul said, maybe there's a problem with our life. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The first thing that we need to understand is to obey the gospel is to submit to be crucified, to submit to putting yourself to death. And again... This means that the old man, that man that I came into this world being, is put to death. The body of sin is to be destroyed. And from that time forward, we are to serve the Lord. One of the problems that I see in, in our world today, and especially, and I'm going to use this term in, in Christendom in whole, a lot of people are dragging around the old man. They haven't turned loose of the old man. I think about the movie and, um, where uh, Crow uh, was fighting in the arena and, and they handcuffed two guys together. And, and he, he, you know, one of the guys got stabbed, so the one guy took his, his sword and he just cut off the other guy's arm, and so now he's got this arm around with him. But I think too 
often we have that other body dragging around with us. And matter of fact, you know, sometimes I, I wonder what people are thinking about. You think about 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. But we try to resuscitate those old things. We try to drag this old man around if we're not careful. I think Steve mentioned this verse, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. We need to understand that we live in Christ now, we don't live with that old man. We, we, we have, we've given up that life. We've turned that life over to the grave. And now we need to understand that each and every sin that we had committed has been washed away by baptism. We're a new person. We are a new creature. And if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. I know there's been occasions at St. Augustine Road when I first um, started preaching there, we had some people visiting that had asked for some food and we studied with them and they obeyed the gospel. And, and, and one of the guys that I was talking to as he came forward, he said, you need to know something about me. And I said, okay. He said, um, I was a drug dealer. <laughs> and I might go to jail still. I said, well, you know, don't know that I've ever had that before, but um, I know I've sinned, and I don't think God looks any differently at my sin than your sin. And those sins are going to be washed away in just a minute. And I tease with him every once in a while. I said, um, we did have to drain the baptistry when we, walk, when we baptize you. And he said, I imagine so. <laughs> But we understand that we become something new. That old man is done away with. But you know what? We have to continue to fight against that. Paul would tell Timothy, you must fight the good fight. Peter would say, we have to war against that old man. It's a constant battle. It's not that it's gone away and we don't have to worry about it anymore. See, there's a religious belief that once you're saved, you're always saved. That old man doesn't matter anymore. But guess what? We still live with the fleshly desires. And so we have to constantly be putting those things away from us. We have to continue to fight. We have to run the race, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 24 through 27. We run so that we may obtain. We have to be faithful. We have to maintain the course. We have to walk on that path. But we can't be dragging the old man with us. We have to let him go. We have to live in such a way that when people see us, they don't see the old dealing, they see the new dealing. They see the one who knows that if I am faithful unto death, I receive a crown of life, Revelation 2 and, chapter, and verse 10. Death is meant to be final. I think we all understand that. And so when we put that old man of sin to death, that's what we have to do. You know, God's promises are final. He extends promises to us. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their iniquities. I will remember, their sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. See, God's faithful with His promises about finality. I'm going to forget the sins that I have forgiven for you. But we have to go into this with this final act. It's a choice that we make, is it not? You think about it. Even John 3.16 for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever chooses, it's a choice, whoever believes in me. So, so we have to make a choice. Every day I have to make a choice. Who am I going to serve? The old man of sin or am I going to serve God? Each and every day, there's going to be a void in your life when you decide to follow Christ. That old man is dead, so now there's a big void in our life. So what do I fill it with? Because, see, I can be recognized by my character, my characteristics. Well, we understand that we should study. We, we become, uh, we become as, as we become a new child of God, the, the Bible talks about it being newborn babes. Do we desire the sincere milk, milk of the Word? Do, do, we really, do we really hunger and thirst after righteousness? See, that's one of the things that's going to fill that void in our lives. How do we know, since this old man of flesh has gone done away with, how do we know what I have to do to make sure that I live according to God's Word? 
We have to implement things. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. Thinking about the things that I, that I have to put into my life now. Because there's, there's an empty place in my life. And if I don't fill it with those things which the Lord wants me to, guess what's going to happen to that space? It's going to be filled. But it's going to be filled with the things that Satan wants us to. We need to hold fast the profession of faith. Hebrews chapter 10. That's also the way that we make sure we maintain our walk without that old man with us. You know, I think about, um, I, I think about uh, what we look like. You know, what we look like to others. When you think about um, the old man that's done away with, how do I know if the old man is alive? How do, how do I know that? You know, if someone, if I'm asking myself and I'm looking at myself and I'm saying, how do I really know if, if what I am doing today is I'm dragging that old man or has that old man been cut off and separated? What do I, what do, I do? How, how do I, can I? How can I test that? This is the application part, okay? So what do I do when I look at myself? Well, there's some things that I think the Bible shows us. How do I know if the old man is alive? Well, one... The old man is alive if we are hearers and not doers. James chapter 1. You know, if I just sit in here and I just hear, oh, great lessons, and I hear positive things to do, and I hear about things that I should be doing, and I walk out of this building and I don't do any of those, guess what? That old man is dragging around with us. I must be someone who is a doer. I must not be conformed to the world. When someone looks at me, do they look at someone who's different from the world? Do people... Do people come up and question you sometimes? Why, why do you think that way? Why do you talk that way? Why, when things go wrong, are you able to, to handle that? And Man, everybody else around you is falling apart. You know, one of the things that we have to do, we have to be thinking about things. I mentioned this earlier. You know, we had this void in our life, so what do we start thinking about? Now that the old man's gone, what do we start thinking about? In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 says we have to think about the right things. You know, we fill up our mind with good thoughts, things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely, good report, that there's being any virtue, being any praise. Think on these things. What are you thinking about during the day? Do you think about the things that you and the old man are missing? Or do I think about others? Do I live in such a way that I'm considering others? One of the things that, you know, I, I, I harp on, <laughs> and, and me and Vic have talked about this a little bit, and I know preachers and elders, that, that, you know, we, this is one of the, the, the big ones. How do we motivate people to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together? You know, I can tell you right now, you're dragging around that old man when it's a challenge for you to get here. You're dragging him, and, and, and he's dragging you. What manner of life are you living? You know, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, Now there is therefore now no condemnation to those who walk according to the Spirit, not, acor not according to the flesh. So we're, how are you walking? See, that's an indication if you're dragging the old man around or if you've crucified him. Each one of us have to, to look at ourselves and decide, do I have this old man with me or is he crucified? Because he better be crucified. <laughs> he better be separated from us. If we're dragging him around, I can tell you this. Heaven will not be our home. 